Well, good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the Friendship Sunday School class of Tap Methodist Church here in New Boston, Texas. Uh, my name is Tim Graham, and today is the 12th of May, uh, 2024, and it's a special day for all mothers everywhere. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, for those of y'all out there celebrating it, make sure you uh, get in contact with your moms today and tell them how much you appreciate them uh, for the upbringing that they gave you. And uh, just reach out to them and let them know they're still appreciated. Uh, a few people we need to keep on our prayer list this morning. Uh, Paul uh, ha Hatcher, need to keep him in your prayer. He and Sandy, as Paul's been recently diagnosed with cancer. Uh, keep Terry Scoggin. Stephanie Clark, or uh, Stephanie Clark, Charlie Clark, uh, Bobby Kilmer, all those that are still going through chemotherapy uh, for the and uh, cancer for their cancer treatment, and also keeping your prayers, Vince Hardage, uh, for his surgery and that everything comes out all right with them. If you uh, if you've got a prayer concern that you'd like to lift up, you can list it here in the comment section, and we can pray for them as well. Uh, there's a lot of people that are suffering uh, from cancer. Uh, nowadays, new diagnosis, people that have been going through it for a while. I don't know what the sudden rash or outbreak is because of, but just keep, in, keep those people in your prayers and also the doctors and the physicians and the nurses uh, that attend to them as well. Uh, if you've got your Bibles handy, we're in the uh, fifth uh, week of our lesson, Authentic in Christ, and this week we're going to be talking about service. And the lessons come from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And it's where kind of Paul is addressing the issues of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he wants the church of Ephesus to understand a few things uh, about the gifts that they've been provided and given and how they are to be used in the service of the church. So if you've got your Bibles handy, turn with me to Ephesians 4, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 16. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all in all. But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into in him who is the head, that is Christ. From him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each does, each part does its work. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this time that we can uh, come together as Christians and pour over your word and, and uh, read, the, read the writings of Paul and see where we're destined to be as far as the gifts that the Holy Spirit has imparted to us and where we fit in. And Lord, we're thankful for the mothers in our lives who... Uh, who are so influential in so many of our lives, either good or bad. But Lord, we thank you for giving them to us and allowing them to raise us in the privilege of being uh, sons and daughters. And Lord, we'd ask that you be with all moms today, uh, those who are grieving the loss of their children, those who are uh, in, uh, in separated relationships, those 
that, uh, that feel that they uh, were not very good mothers to their children. We'd ask that you wrap your loving arms around them and comfort them on this day, Lord, that they would feel worthy of their calling. All these things we ask in your name. Amen. As we, uh, as we read through this uh, letter to the church of Ephesus that Paul has written, uh, we find out one thing in the, in the first four verses, that he's promoting unity. That regardless of what gifts that uh, are bestowed upon us by the Holy Spirit, there is one thing that must be tantamount to spreading the gospel, and that's everybody must be reading out of the same book. Everybody's got to be of one mind. Everybody's got to be of one uh, belief, uh, because when different beliefs creep into a church and different theologies creep into a church, that's when they start blowing apart. And, and the work of the evangelists, the works of the apostles, the works of the uh, pastors and disciples are all for naught if there's not unity within the church. And uh, I'm, there's never a, a time when I'm uh, not reminded of where unity is so important uh, in today's world where there are so many different interpretations of Scripture uh, that are so far off of what God intended that new Christians, infants in Christianity, may not know where to turn. They may be uh, be convinced by good arguments. They may be swayed uh, by what society says. And uh, the scriptures are offensive at times uh, to those who are not living according to the scripture, uh, to those who are living in sin, to those who are far away from the Lord Word of God. But that's where the apostles, that's where the disciples, that's where uh, the pastors and the teachers come into play. And that's what Paul is doing here, uh, that he is stressing the importance uh, that don't let any false teachings into your church, lest your church dwindle, lest your church die out. Uh, because everywhere we see that Paul went, he stayed in Ephesus for three years, churches uh, flourished. Uh, they continued to thrive because people uh, look to the hope. They look to the accountability. They look to the uh, promising words that the scriptures gave. And, uh, and Paul was quick to stamp out any ignorance or any uh, societal beliefs that came in to the church that were not of scripture. And uh, we're going to hear a lot about that this morning. Um, on the, and, and we'll hear a little bit about talents and gifts. Talents are the things that God has given you. Gifts are the things that are imparted to us by the Holy Spirit. They're two totally different things. Uh, and we often use our talents. We confuse those uh, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there's some things uh, that God has provided to us uh, that can further enhance the gifts of the Holy Spirit that, that, that he has provided. Uh, but we're going to kind of break it down this morning. We're going to narrow in on, uh, on three uh, positions. We're going to narrow in on the apostles. We're going to uh, focus in on the prophets. And we're also going to talk about the evangelist, uh, what they are called to do. In Ephesians, Paul sets first, first sets forth a foundation in unity uh, in the one confession prompted by the Holy Spirit. And then he introduces the, the variety of gifts that people are entrusted with. And I want you to know that all who truly, truly confess Jesus as Lord do so by the Holy Spirit and thus attest his presence in their life. But that does not mean there are no distinctions to be made among them. Paul's concern now is not so much with unity as with the various gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's a tendency to put pastors, teachers, and evangelists on a spiritual pedestal. Uh, pastors can gain enormous popularity uh, based on their message, based on their facilities, based on their good looks or their charisma. Bible teachers can have huge followings, and evangelists are known to fill large arenas. But for a moment, I want you to put aside every conception that you have of these three people, these pastors, teachers, and evangelists. Forget that many of them are held in high esteem. Think of these positions not as talents, but as spiritual gifts, which they are, and want you to realize that you too could have one of these gifts. Uh, a teacher correctly handles my word, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. A seminary degree may be nice, but it's not tantamount 
to teaching the word of God. It's not a prerequisite. Do you have a knack for sharing the good news with people who haven't heard it? You may have the gift of evangelism. And don't overlook these gifts and don't assume you need to be well known to use them. And I think that's where a lot of people, uh, I mean, we look to Philip, how he was able to witness to large crowds of people, but he was also able to witness to a eunuch in a carriage in Gaza and even baptized him. So he was comfortable with small and big audiences as well. So we don't need to be too hung up on the fact of how big a crowd we witness to or how big a crowd we teach to. We just need to handle the word of God correctly. And God loves uh, various gifts. He loves diversity so much so that when he sends a snowstorm, there are no two snowflakes that are alike. He loves the variety of people in general. He loves that we're different. He loves that we look different. He loves that we act different. We are all part of his creation and he marvels uh, at how many different varieties of us they are. The first thing we're going to focus on today is the apostles. And uh, a lot of times we go back to the original 12 apostles, but those were not the only apostles, but they were the original ones that were exposed to the resurrection. Uh, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to the 12 and then also to all the apostles, men such as Paul, Barnabas, uh, Adrogonus and Junius, Apollos and Silas. These were all apostles that Jesus appeared to. He appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus and asked him why he persecuted him. Uh, you know, they, he made many different appearances to these apostles. And the first thing that they did was continue on with their work. They went and spread the word of God. The word apostle comes from a technical nautical term in the Greek language. It referred to an expedition when the admiral over a fleet of ships who under the orders of his rulers founded a colony. And uh, one chosen as a possible would have great authority and would travel extensively either in surrounding lands or maybe even in foreign lands. So an apostle who was commissioned as a messenger with authority to either start a new colony, uh, to set up a new town, he was given great authority by the ones who sent him. And that's really what the apostles uh, uh, of Jesus were done. They were given great authority to continue his work once he was gone. History reveals that new churches grew wherever the apostles preached the gospels because they had that authority from Jesus. Missionary and apostle are often used as equals, but they're, but they're not the same. The missionary is sent from as opposed to being called to a particular church. Uh, we think about missionaries in, in today's modern age, uh, when a missionary may be sponsored by a church and he's sent from there to another church, but an apostle is called to a particular church, much like the one that, that uh, Paul spent three years in Ephesus uh, establishing this church. He, he did not want to leave until... Uh, they were growing, they were firmly rooted in the faith, and he stayed with them, but he wasn't with any particular church that they uh, sent him on his way or that they sponsored him. He moved on from Ephesus, he would go to Thessalonica, he would go to Corinth. Uh, I mean, he traveled extensively throughout the Roman world uh, in his day, spreading the word of God. He was an outstanding example of this gift. He extended the church throughout the modern day, the Mediterranean world, and he would give the church oversight in its beginning stages. And when he had trained leadership, he left the church in their care and moved on to plant a new church. And that, that was much the, uh, the, uh, the responsibility of the apostles. Some of the, uh, motivations that, uh, that you see when you have an apostle, the uh, apostle, they want to preach the gospel in unevangelized community, whether it be at home or overseas. They want to start new churches. They want to reach unreached persons with the gospel. They want to lay a foundation for a new congregation and they want to move on to a new field when that church is established. Those are some of the motivations uh, that an apostle has and we can see each and every one of those traits in Paul. When, when he firmly established church, 
he would move on to the next town. He wanted to start more and more of them. He did not want to stay where he was. Now he would write letters back to these churches, encouraging them and, and, you know, and, and telling them the good news that he's heard. But he would also write back to admonish them if they, if they got out of line or if they started doing something that, that wasn't of scripture. Uh, he would correct them as well. And the manifestations that characterized the gifts of an apostle, he would help begin and lead a new church. He would have the ability to cross cultural, cultural and ethnic lines to minister. And man, what a challenge that is today, especially in the Western world, to cross those cultural lines, to cross those ethnic lines, to minister, to, to give the word of God to people. He was unafraid to undertake what God wanted done. He showed the ability to face new situations with challenge and joy, and he easily adapted to new environments. Uh, you know, how, how, how different were these towns uh, that Paul uh, was constantly going to, yet he was able to successfully establish churches in all of these towns. Uh, so he was very adept at going into town, winning the hearts of the people uh, with scripture, establishing these new churches, training new leaders, and then moving on. He was great at that. And, uh, you know, and, and you look back on Paul's life, and God knew exactly what he was doing when he chose Paul. Uh, he didn't choose one of the original 12 to do that. They might not have had the ability. Uh, but the Holy Spirit came down on Paul and gave him that gift. And now he was probably talented in other ways, uh, but the Holy Spirit gave him the gift of apostleship where he was able to go into town, establish new churches, let them help them grow, and then move on. Well, that brings us to our second one, a prophet. What is a prophet like? Well, in Old and New Testament alike, the prophet was in charge of receiving the word of God and repeating it back to the people verbatim, not leaving anything out, not adding anything. He was responsible for delivering the word to God. And oftentimes, uh, it wasn't kind of a secondary uh, feature of being a, a prophet was he would oftentimes that he would predict future events. Well, the gift of prophecy, that's a spirit given ability as well to receive and communicate timely spirit inspired messages from God's word that may result in edification, exhortation, and consolation of all believers. You can find that in Romans 12 chapter six and verse in first Corinthians uh, chapter 14, verse three. Uh, I mean, and we find all throughout the Bible where God would impart his word to prophets and they were required uh, to go out and deliver it just as he said, okay? We look at Jonah, uh, how God called him to Nineveh and deliver a message uh, to the people of Nineveh. We look at Moses, how he was called uh, when he was tending his father-in-law's sheep in the wilderness to go to Egypt to free God's people. And God would tell him what to say. He would instruct him what to say to Pharaoh. And again, what to say to the people. Okay. Another gift of the Holy Spirit. God wasn't communicating with the millions of people uh, that, that Moses took out of Egypt. He would uh, conduct his business with Moses. He would bring him up on the mountain uh, to impart his words to him and expect him to go back down and deliver the message to the people. And, and as a prophet, if you're given that, uh, given that gift, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to misconstrue the word of God. And that's the gift of the Holy Spirit is he takes the word of God. He can only say what he has been told. He cannot get out of his lane. He cannot get out of his realm. He cannot repeat anything that's false. The only thing he can do is repeat what he has been told. And so when we take the word of God uh, and say something different, the Holy Spirit is likely to pull that gift from us because if we cannot be relied upon to correctly handle the word of God, the Holy Spirit will deprive us of that gift. He will take it away from us. And time and again, we see throughout the Bible, even where King Saul uh, got out of line and, and God left him, he abandoned him and, and how hopeless must God feel? How hopeless must an individual feel when God departs from them? And, and it happened a few times in the Bible. And I would hate to think that the Holy Spirit gave up on me or that God gave up on me because I wasn't doing what they asked. I wasn't 
using my gifts as they intended. Uh, if I took the, the word of God and then interpreted it in some other way that he did not tell me, uh, man, I, 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 don't, I don't know if I can deal with that rejection. That would be pretty tough. So, so as prophets, they want to continue to communicate uh, with God as well. So they're very careful to dictate to people what exactly what God tells them. Both the Old and New Testament prophets had basic similarities. They received their message from God and proclaimed the word of God to the people. They denounced sin. They warned against future judgment. They took a stand on national issues and they preached a message of repentance and predicted future events. And oftentimes I see teachers and pastors and evangelists today uh, that don't do this. They don't uh, preach the truth. They don't stand on national issues or take a stand on national issues. They don't preach a message of repentance. And, and, if, and if they're not doing these things, they're indicative of what a prophet does. You probably can't believe him. You're best not to follow their advice. You're best not to follow their theology because that's not from God. That's not who God sends as a messenger. That's not who God sends as a teacher. That's not who he sends as a prophet. They're going to have these characteristics if they're a prophet of God. John the Baptist was another example of a prophet. Of a prophet. Well, what do we learn about prophets from his, his example? Well, he was a bold and dynamic preacher. He was able to discern the motives of the people. He was direct. He was frank in his speaking. And he preached for a decision. Repent of your sins. Repent of your sins and make a decision today whether you're going to repent of your sins or not. And he had the ability to identify evil. He had the courage to openly reprove evil as he did with the leaders of his time. Uh, when, he, when he called them out on their sin, when he told them about their sin uh, and they threw him in jail, that did not stop him from opening his mouth and calling out evil. And the listener's will responded to the message, and he even prophesied the day of Pentecost. John the Baptist wasn't worried about making friends as a prophet. He was worried about correctly delivering the message of God, the one that God had given to him. Now, I'm not saying that John the Baptist was perfect because there are times that he doubted that Jesus was the Messiah, but he certainly went about his life and lived his life trying to use his gifts of the Holy Spirit to win others to Christ, to, to call them back into obedience, to, to get them to turn away from their evil, to get them to repent of their sins. And the success that he had out in the wilderness without a, uh, without a nice facility and only the Jordan to baptize people in, he attained a lot of success and a lot of people came to see him because of his gifts from the Holy Spirit. And the third gift is that of an evangelist. The gift of evangelism is a spirit-given ability to persuade people to pers uh, receive Christ as their personal Savior and become their disciple. And that's um, talked about in Ephesians 4.11. The evangelist is primarily a messenger of the good news. And Philip illustrates a believer with the gift of evangelism. He is willing to speak to people about Christ. His message as an evangelist to the Samaritans was the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ in Acts 12. He was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit and traveled wherever the Lord directed him. From preaching to the multitudes in Samaria, he obeyed the Spirit and preached to one Ethiopian in Gaza. Then he went to Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. And so as an evangelist, he traveled widely. There's no record of Philip engaging in a, mystery, in a ministry wider than evangelism. And although he preached in an unevangelized area, he did not plant churches. He left that for the work of the apostles to accomplish. He didn't go about establishing any churches. And you can remember when he was talking with the eunuch in his chariot, that they came upon a body of water, water and the eunuch wanted to be baptized. So they got out of the chariot, they baptized the eunuch, and Philip was immediately left. 
he was gone. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure that was kind of different or weird to the unit because he expected, well, where'd he go? I, I mean, I, I can't ask him any more questions. You know, that was Philip's only purpose, to interpret the word of God to you, to baptize you. His work here is done. And they immediately took him out of that. He used the scripture to preach Christ to people. When Philip preached to the Ethiopian, he opened his mouth and beginning from the scripture, he preached Jesus to him. So Philip was experiencing both personal and mass evangelism. But the key there is he preached out of the Bible. He did not preach from his own word. He saw what the eunuch was reading and he interpreted scripture for him. He did not go and snatch some other uh, medium. He did not uh, in, depend upon his own understanding. He, he got it from the word of God. And that's so many times we say things that we probably don't believe. Well, maybe we believe them, but there's not anything scriptural about them. And we don't use the Bible as a resource to back up our decisions. And we should, because Philip certainly did. Paul certainly did. They used scripture in everything that they did because they didn't want anybody calling them out on an error or calling them out on something that wasn't in scripture. And so many times today, we want a message that'll play well to the public. And oftentimes that message does not play well to the public. The public gets irate. They get frustrated. They get mad because we call out their sin that they're living in. And we cite the scripture from where it comes. And all of a sudden they don't like the Bible anymore because the Bible calls us to a higher standard of living. The Bible calls us and tells us how to interact with people and how to live our lives in a godly manner. And there are a lot of people out there not living their lives in a godly manner that want to, that want to hear something that makes them feel good. And that's not what the Bible is for. The Bible is to be interpreted correctly. And so teachers, pastors, apostles, disciples, Evangelists must handle with the word of God with great care. And they must be careful to preach out of the Bible. And the people responded in Philip's day to making a commitment to receive Christ. Philip had a spirit-given ability to communicate the gospel. And when people heard their message, they responded, much like the eunuch who wanted to be baptized. He received Christ and followed the Lord into baptism. And the best evidence that one possesses the gifts of evangelism is that people are coming in Christ in response to his mystery, to, to the ministry. Uh, there was a uh, movie that came out recently, and my goodness, I can't believe that I, that I can't remember it, where out in California, uh, there was a, uh, a ministry that was started, and they started baptizing people. Uh, in Pirate's Cove and throngs and throngs of people showed up to be baptized, uh, in, in this, uh, in this cove. And, and that's an example of evangelists. He's reaching the hippies. He's reaching the unreachable. He's, he's given the, these, these people that had rarely ever heard the word of God before hope. And in response to that message, they would come out and be baptized. They heard the words. They found comfort in the scripture. What is a good evangelist like? Motivations that characterize the gift of evangelism is to proclaim Christ as their personal savior whenever possible. They lead unbelievers to receive Christ as their savior Lord and they intercede in prayer much for the lost. They pray for the lost. I, I notice a lot of times that I don't pray for the lost. I pray for ones that are sick. I say, I pray for believers uh, that are going through a tough time. Uh, but not a lot of times do I pray for the lost. And maybe that's a, um, I, 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 that's a flaw of mine that I probably should change. Uh, but the information that I see out there, the information that we have access to, I can't imagine how anyone would be lost today with the information that we have readily available to us. But there are. There are people out there that are just as lost as they can be. I don't know if they don't want to read. I don't know if they don't want to hear the message or what. Uh, but I'm like, man, I, I don't know if I can get to them if they got all this information available to them, all these effective pastors and preachers, evangelists and apostles. If they can't reach them, who am I? Who am I that I would be able to reach them? So we need 
to pray for the lost, and that's one characteristic of an evangelist. And to follow up with discipleship training could conserve results and to train new converts to lead others to Christ. You know, how did you get to Christ? How were you led to the point where you believed in Christ? Go out there and share your story. Go out there and tell others that may be able to relate to you. Uh, That's what an evangelist is. They go out there and relate their story to the ones that... uh, uh, that have never heard the message. They say, well, I was once in your spot. I didn't believe. I didn't uh, know who God was. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. And they're able to reach people like that. And manifestations that characterize the gift of evangelism, they have personally led others to Christ. They witness frequently on the job with some decisions, and they have the ability to turn a conversation into a witnessing opportunity. They're able to move people with their own personal testimony of salvation, and they readily participate in the church's evangelism ministries. Wherever they want to go, whatever community, or whatever neighborhood they want to go into, they sign up for that stuff because that's where they feel most comfortable. That's where they feel they can reach a lot of people. Well, how many evangelists does the average church have? And I thought that was a very... Um, uh, it's a very good question, but I, but I was like, man, I, I've never really thought about how many evangelists our church has. You know, as I as I go through the people that attend regularly on Sunday or that that come to Sunday school, you get to thinking: Are any of these people evangelists? Do they go into neighborhoods? Do they go into countries? Do they go into towns uh, to witness to people? But the average Christian church can re- expect that approximately five to ten percent of its active adult members will have been given the gift of evangelism. And I'll go, man, that's, that's pretty high because normally we have anywhere from 90 to 100 people come to church. So you're telling me that anywhere from five to 10 people in our church evangelists, man, I, that, that's a pretty big number. I wouldn't have thought that we'd have that many. But a mounting quantity of empirical evidence in the case that of a church has as few as 5% of its active members that will evangelize a healthy growth pattern of more than 100% a decade is a realistic expectation. You mean to tell me that in uh, next decade we should be worshiping 200 people? Uh, well, then maybe we don't have 5% evangelism in our church because um, we're not reaching the young people. We've got an older demographic that attend church here And if we were to fail in the next 50 years, we wouldn't be the first church to fail. But the most ones that I see fail are the ones that don't have any young people coming, that are not evangelizing young adults, that are not don't have anything for kids, uh, don't know how to reach them. Those are the churches that I see hurting where they're just hanging on because my dad or my granddad or my mom or my grandmother went here and I've I've got to keep going here until we close the doors. Well, but what are you doing to evangelize? What are you doing to bring people to your church? What are you bringing to the neighborhood? Are you you trying to reach anybody? Are you trying to recruit anybody for God? And in a small church like that where you have maybe five or ten people that are attending church on a regular basis, do you have one or two that are going out in the community every week that are evangelizing and trying to bring other people to Christ, I don't know. That'd be a lot of work for for one or two people, even in a town the size of New Boston. But in what ways are people who do not have the gift of evangelism to be involved in the activity of evangelism? Evangelism is so important for church growth that no one can understand why many Christian circles tend to overemphasize it. All Christians need to be prepared to share their faith with unbelievers and lead them to Christ whenever the opportunity presents itself. This is a Christian role that corresponds to this spiritual gift. Having said this, it's time that we admit many good, faithful, consecrated, mature Christian people are in love with Jesus Christ, but they are not and do not care to be significantly involved in evangelism in any way. Indirectly, maybe yes. They will contribute to the growth, uh, but they won't go around looking for new opportunities to share their faith. 
And and I, as I look back on my week, man, there were plenty of opportunities uh, to share my faith. Uh, opportunities at a Bible study, opportunities at a devotional, opportunities at a restaurant. I mean, there's so many things uh, where you can share your faith. Uh, I mean, there was a a lady on Tuesday that entered Denny's. She, I could tell that she was struggling. I could tell that you know uh, that she wasn't from around here, and 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 I bought her breakfast and invited her to a, to a Wednesday night dinner. Um, I mean, that that's evangelism. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, she didn't come to church on Wednesday night and she called again on Thursday to ask me to do something for her. Uh, but that's evangelism, taking, taking the word of God to other people. She saw that we were studying, uh, at Denny's, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, our Bible study, our, uh, um, lectionary. Uh, I mean, we're, we're there with a group of people in the middle of a restaurant doing that. We're praying before we eat. Uh, we've got our Bibles out. We're asking biblical questions out loud. We're not trying to hold it a secret. Well, when you're doing that in the middle of a restaurant, you're going to draw a little bit of attention, whether it be from the other patrons around you or maybe even from the waitresses. You're evangelizing there. Pastors and teachers, is this one gift or two? Well, the word pastor comes from a Greek word that means to shepherd. Hence, the gift involves feeding, leading, guiding, caring, and protecting the sheep. But the word teacher has special significance in the Greek, who says that the use of linking pastor and teachers, you cannot be a true pastor without also being a teacher. Without teaching, the pastor could not function properly. And the pastor as a teacher has been called to equip the saints for the work of a ministry. So what that says as a pastor, your primary role is to teach. Sure, you may be good at feeding, leading, guiding, caring, and protecting the sheep, but you've got to be able, you've got to be able to teach the word of God, and you've got to be able to correctly interpret uh, the word of God, the Bible. How can we learn about the role of Timothy as his example? Teach the doctrines that lead to godliness. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 11 be an example and provide no opportunity for criticism. Number three, read the Bible publicly for exhortation and teaching. Exercise and use your spiritual gifts and concentrate on your ministry so progress can be seen. And lastly, carefully evaluate your gift of teaching. Are you good at it? Can you improve? Are you awful at it? What are ways that you can, uh, what are steps that you can take to improve? You can always model example of effective teachers. I listen to, to podcasts and to videos all day long trying to, to find out or to figure out how to better be a better teacher, be a better instructor, get my point across more effectively. Because I know that God has blessed me with many talents, okay? But if the Holy Spirit is going to bless me with a gift, I'm going to have to learn how to use that gift. I'm going to have to uh, to learn what I'm good at, or and and trying different things is 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 the one thing I'm not embarrassed to do. I'm not I'm not embarrassed to fail. I'm not. Uh, I don't mind putting myself out there. I don't mind stretching myself at times uh, to to my knowledge or to my limits. Uh, and that's probably the reason that I attend a few Bible studies every week because I want to hear what other people are saying about the Bible. I want to see if I can effectively communicate in, in another way uh, because there's a certain group of people that I may or may not be able to reach uh, depending on the way that I look or the way that I act or the way that I dress. But if I preach out of the Bible, if, I, if I'm able to deliver a message out of the Bible uh, to more effectively communicate what God is trying to say, wouldn't I be interested in doing that? Well, absolutely I would. Because I'd like to reach everybody that I talk to. I know that I don't, but I'd like to be able to. I'd like for the Holy Spirit uh, to give me that gift, but but maybe that's not my gift. Maybe my gift is preaching to, to one or two or to small groups. It's not to preach to large groups of people. And I need to be content with that gift. I need to focus on that gift. I need to specialize on the, in that gift and work in ways to improve. 
But who I preach in front of is not any of my business. How I deliver that message is. Because the Holy Spirit will provide the audience. God will put me in places where he needs me in this church. Many churches have divided their congregations into cell groups of eight to 12 families and have assigned elders with the gift of shepherding to care for each of these groups. And David Goodwin, our pastor, David Goodwin, has done this exact thing since he's been here. He's broken us down into shepherd groups, and certain shepherds care for their flock. And, and it, it can range anywhere from eight to 12 families. And they, they, they meet together in homes. They, they might meet for a weekly Bible study, but they minister to one another's needs. And then they meet with the rest of the congregation on Sunday. And the goal as the shepherd is to provide pastoral care that will help the sheep develop toward maturity. Well, how many of you know what your spiritual gift is? How do you discover it? The Corinthian believers were ignorant about the proper use of their gifts, which were important in the life of the early church. So Paul instructed them in the basic understanding of the gifts to correct their misuse. The best antidote is sound teaching. It's imperative that we understand clearly the basic principles regarding gifts and their use as set forth in the Bible before we define, discover, and develop our spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are imparted by the Holy Spirit. It's a special ability given by the Holy Spirit according to grace. And all believers are given at least one spiritual gift. And the following verses kind of underscore this truth. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it says, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. In Ephesians 4, 7, it says, unto every one of us is given grace, according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Every believer without exception is given a spiritual gift. The Bible not only stresses universality of gifts, but accountability to God for the use of said gifts. This twofold emphasis is explained by Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4.10, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold of the grace of God. Imagine two churches that are the same size, the same denomination, the same theology, they're in the same similar size town. They're both the same size, except in gift church, everyone knows their spiritual gift and is ministering according to their gifting. In no gift church, no one knows what their spiritual gifts are. They're just serving according to the need in front of them. They're very busy, but would you imagine these churches to be different? Yes, yes, they would. The gift church is going to be more effective at using their uh, ministries to witness to people because they've got a plan in place. They know who they're witnessing to. They've got a mission field in front of them and they've got a plan. In no gift church, they just kind of wait around for something to happen and, and if a need arises, they fix it. Well, the thing about that is that's a, a church without a plan is not going to succeed for very long. You need to have a plan in place to use every one of the gifts uh, that you have. And I look around our church and I see many, many people who are employing their gifts of teaching, who are employing their gifts of caring, who are uh, employing their gifts in, in many different fields uh, because we've got so many programs here around the church that witness to young people here in the community, whether it be through upward basketball, bereavement uh, uh, meals for families, our youth group, uh, we use our facilities to play basketball, to, to have Easter egg hunts, to uh, put blow up houses and bring, bring kids in to church to, to, to attract them to church and therefore bring their parents to church and put them around other believers, put them around others who, who have hope, put them around others who know the word of God. And that way they make an experience the same relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Uh, we try to bring them in here. Now, there's other times uh, when we reach out in the community and we go on a function. We Every Friday night, we have dinner out with a pastor. 
and we choose a restaurant in Friday on Friday night to go into the community and to witness to others, hey, there are groups of us that go out and have a good time. Hey, you can be a part of this ministry too. Uh, you know, it's, it's just amazing what this church does, both in and out of this church, to use their spiritual gifts to bring others to know Christ as well. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We appreciate you uh, listening to Lesson 5. We'll be back next week for the final lesson, Lesson number 6, in this Authentic in Christ. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Happy Mother's Day.